Well, as we hear this passage, we need to hear it in the full context of both the day of wrath and the day of hope. Because this is the part of Zephaniah that is a little bit like the nerdy TV character who's just been crushingly shot down by a girl, but he has the long view in mind. And so he responds with a, so you're saying there is a chance. (laughs) The two chapters leading up to this passage have just been absolutely torching the Israelites for their pridefulness and all people who turn away from God to put their trust in other things. Zephaniah describes his people as more eager, more eager for corrupt deeds than for worshiping God, a people who listen to no voice of correction, whose streets are emptied from goodness and trust, whose leaders are roaring lions and hungry wolves. It's likely at this time the new king, Josiah, had just rediscovered the scroll of the law of Moses in the renovation of the temple. But this reminder of how they relate to a God who has saved them is still not enough of a warning. The faithless pride of the Israelites causes them to fall out of line with the direction God wants to lead them. And it opens them up to shame and disaster, says the prophet Zephaniah. That description of the day of wrath sets us up as listeners today, to realize that we're so much like those ancient people. As we rarely sing and shout and lift praises to God, except for maybe on a Sunday morning, with all of our hearts, because we often are just as slow to remember our correct place before God and to trust in his promises to renew us as he dwells here in our midst. The hope of the gospel that we have this Advent season is that we're seeing Zephaniah's day of hope begin to dawn. We have a Savior coming who will dwell with us, who will make clear our dear position in relationship to God, and who will renew us in our struggle to fully rely on God's rule and celebrate it with all our hearts, giving us a real reason for joy. Like this day of hope, the joy of this Advent season and of Christmas is both in anticipation and in fulfillment. In anticipation and fulfillment. Thinking of it like the joy of unwrapping Christmas presents, we have the preemptive joy of anticipation that children and maybe other optimists feel at the prospect of getting to unwrap presents on Christmas morning. Maybe it's expressed in a shout of joy as the first chunk is torn out of the wrapping paper that gives us an idea of what the gift that lies beneath may be, even before we have it in hand or fully know it. And then there's also a second joy, a joy of fulfillment. Fulfillment in actually having that present out of the wrapping and knowing exactly what it is, being able to use it. Well, one problem, even with this joy of anticipation and fulfillment, is that talking about joy in this season can be a non sequitur, can be difficult because often the season is the opposite of joy for some people. This happens at times when Christmases mark the unfulfillment of our expectations. If we don't get what we've really been longing for, if we are are unable to live up to expectations set for us, if we're missing our loved ones, And that's the reason why we have the Blue Christmas Service coming up this Friday. The point of the Blue Christmas Service is to acknowledge that sometimes the season turns out blue because we don't experience the hope that our anticipation will be fulfilled. And that's the honest-to-goodness way that life is 
sometimes. But Zephaniah points out for us that in light of or in spite of what we have gone through, we can still have joy at the dawning of this day of hope. Zephaniah knows that the pridefulness that he sees of those who devour like wolves their hearts in the wrong places and the dry experience of walking through a deserted part of life, those are not the end of the story. We can still choose to be humble and to look for a dawn in God's ultimate victory of life over death. The rest of the story is seeing and believing and remembering the large promises of God dwelling with us, renewing us, gathering us up so that we have a reason to humbly trust our God, whether things be large or small. We have to be and live like my most vivid image of joy right now. That's an image of little children stretching to look over the windowsill, trying to get a glimpse of a parent returning home. In the case of my children, they've been waiting what probably feels like too long, but then at the first glimpse of a bike or a car or a face, there's an interruption of joy and squealing, anticipating that soon their daddy will come in and will give them a hug and will give them all sorts of fun attention. Now, I know that they don't always experience time with daddy as being that great, in times when I'm not answering their requests right away or trying to clean them up or correct them from their habit of standing on the couch. <laughs> but as the anticipation builds for the great time that they know they might have with Daddy, this joy just happens and it's contagious to everyone in the house. How much more then should we be expectant and peeking and whooping it up when we're waiting to see glimpses of Jesus being the Emmanuel that we're asking to come, the God dwelling with us, working to save us, working to gather us up, reversing shame and freeing us from broken tendencies. The God of Zephaniah is a God we can trust to be among us in our pain and our hurting, a God who rejoices in redeeming the brokenness we experience from ways that are far from him. Having joy at the anticipation of fulfillment of God's future promises may not always be a very concrete thing to us. Or it may not be simply a joy at the general sureness of salvation for eternal life. It can be like a recent conversation that I had with someone here at the church about a future project he was working on. He didn't have any clear sense of when it would be completed or how exactly God would make things work to pull it all off. But after thinking and praying about it, he did have a very certain joy of knowing that this was in line with God's desires that God would have the victory in it and delight in bringing it to completion in some fashion. And I could feel that joy too, anticipating the future fulfillment of God's promises in some little or some big way, confident that God, the God who dwells with us was already rejoicing over this and working to accomplish his purposes in the very hope of it. The joy of hope can be one that builds with anticipation and expectation. It can also be one squelched, squelched by unfulfillment and despair. But even today, I would urge us to be encouraged by the prophet's vision of this second day. To be encouraged by the good news of God coming to be with us in Jesus Christ and to take heart as the poet Longfellow did in his famous Christmas carol. I quote, And in despair I bowed my head. There is no peace on earth, I said. 
for hate is strong and mocks the song of peace on earth, goodwill to all. Then pealed the bells more loud and deep, God is not dead, nor doth he sleep. The wrong shall fail, the right prevail, with peace on earth, goodwill to all. Till ringing, singing on its way, the world revolved from night to day. A voice, a chime, a chant sublime of peace on earth, goodwill to all. Our challenge today is to prepare our lives to be different in light of the type of expectant joy that the prophet Zephaniah shares that was shared by the angels on that holy night, that was shared by John the Baptist and shared by the graceful life of Jesus Christ. Let us find a way to make this joy a realistic response in our lives to this future hope of peace on earth, goodwill to all. Oh God, we can't, so you must. We're, ye we're yours, so show us the way. Amen.